Getting up close and intimate. Totally not taboo with Tracy. Celebrating sexual positivity both in and outside the bedroom. Hi, learner lovers. I'm Tracy of uh, Totally Me Intimacy and Relationship Coaching. Welcome to Totally Not Taboo. Today we will be discussing what is taboo? What is sex? And why is it actually taboo? We'll be talking to my guest, Judy Alter. And um, Judy and I have known each other for 30 years. I met her when I was a student social worker at Family Life Centre. And she was actually my mentor and my educator. So I've learned a lot from Judy. And over the years, we've become very close friends. Um, and because I cannot remember everything about Judy in terms of her professional credits. Um, would you please just give me um, some leeway here and I'm going to read all about Judy and what she has achieved in so many years in practice. So Judy is a trained therapist with over 25 years of experience in private and corporate practice in the public arena. She's held various portfolios during this period that include training in organizations, management coaching, facilitation groups and forums, teaching clinicians, and leading sexuality education teams. She has extensive experience in facilitating healthy relationships between couples within groups and in the corporate arena. She has consulted within organizations that has allowed her to foster effective connection between employees and their management. Her paradigm encourages individuals to gain direction and meaningful lives in this challenging world. She has been invited to talk on many radio stations and appear on television programs. She has contributed to a book on women's issues, which is a particular passion of hers. Her holistic, integrated approach assists others to perform at optimum and impact on their internal and external worlds. Judy has been very involved in educating clinicians and individuals to feel comfortable and knowledgeable about their sexual needs and health. Judy is passionate about encouraging women to take ownership of their bodies and sexuality to stand behind themselves as their own personal warrior and sexual goddess. Judy, without further ado, I would like to welcome you as my guest on the show, Totally Not Taboo. Thank so, you, Trace. And it's lovely to be here. And it's lovely to be here on your first show. It's a great honor to spend this time with you. Um, Judy, as my friend mm -hmm. and now my colleague, I, I want to please thank you for being my first guest on this show. And for all our listeners and our, all our viewership out there, I want you to please be patient with me <laughs> during this very first interview because I'm still learning work. Perfect. No issues. And who better to take me there than my friend? Of course. So, Judy, I'm going to open this discussion with the topic, here. why is sex so taboo? Okay, well, it's a very complicated question to answer, and I suppose it depends who you're asking. So, where are the areas here? They get a little bit tricky. Of course, our culture. Um, we know that in certain parts of the world, culturally, there's no taboo around sex. In fact, there's a lot of separation around men and women, and sometimes especially women, to explore their sexuality, to feel comfortable with it, to experiment. There's no great value on virginity. Um, there's really just that knowledge that sexual happiness gives us a feeling of, of feeling good in the world and uh, feeling good in our relationships. 
But for the main part, that's not mainstream, certainly within our culture, within our cultures in this country, for example, there is quite a, a lot of heaviness around sexuality and the kind of practices we do within sexuality and our sexual orientation. There still is, we find in our own cultures in this country, a lot of heaviness, a lot of can't do's, a lot of judgment, a lot of stigmatization around certain choices, practices related to gender, orientation, age, and so on. And where does that come from? <clears throat> well, it's, it's, it's both an easy and a hard question because for many people, and I'm sure you see it in your own practice, they can't tell you that there was a word or a sentence or a particular attitude there was just this experience they had of their own parented experience that sex was precious to be kept for, that uh, you only had to do minimums, minimums, and that can be from family culture, religion, all the dogma around our bodies and around sexuality in our religions, and that is pretty much across the board. There are definite rules around our sexuality and having sex and enjoying sex within most religions that we talk about. And um, also there's some culturalization around women and their bodies and how powerful they are. If you look at the kind of practices pursue to stamp down women and their sexuality that's not necessarily only religious based but it's also about patriar patri patriarchal um, understanding of women and their bodies and how you need to be if you want to be a male man so that kind of covers it's it's almost there's no end to the kind of taboos that I still see in private practice and the lack of permission we give ourselves to just have a good time and just to feel comfortable around what our body is, how beautifully it functions and what it looks like. We, this just kind of all that stuff still exists out there. In terms of today, media, social media, influences, nothing much has really changed you would think that this new generation, which both yourself and myself don't really belong to, that there would have been, there's a lot of liberalism around sexual choices among certain communities, but there's still quite a lot of taboo acceptability, even within those subcultures. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've covered a lot um, of issues that actually... Um, I wanted you to discuss, but we can still expand on so many things. Um, and you and I both come from a particular religious community yeah. um, where we have both in our personal lives had exposure to um, dogma around women and how we should actually cover so much of our bodies for the preservation of um, our sexuality and the sacredness around keeping our bodies for our husbands and not for the, the population in general to have privy to our beauty and our sexuality and so on. So it's very similar when I look at our religion compared to other religions. The, the idea, the philosophy behind that is very similar to other religions. So tell me a little bit more about that concept and what it does to a woman's sense of self in the world and how that actually inhibits an expression of sexuality once she gets married. Yeah, I think that this is a complicated question to answer because I think that there are many women that choose that level of modesty for themselves as part of their religious practice and perhaps they're empowered and they understand it in a particular way. Certainly I've heard comments about women's modesty around keeping men safe 
So because men are seen as these kind of quite sexually predatory human beings, um, which of course there are some, but it doesn't speak to all men, but there's that kind of overview that women are the, the gatekeepers of men's sexuality, that if we dress in a particular way, if we talk in a particular way, if we enjoy in a particular way, that we then expose our men folk to their animalistic, primitive urges, and then that is our fault. So certainly in certain cultures, even being raped speaks of it being our fault because we have enticed, we have seduced, we have dressed in a particular way, and that is no longer male responsibility in terms of their behaviour. So I do think that that's driven by somewhat of a religious dogma and a perspective. If you live in a society where you don't have choice, and choice is an interesting word, but if we just take it at its most basic level of saying, I choose to do this or that, and I've read and I'm informed and I really believe I have that choice. If you live in a Western society, then perhaps um, it is a little bit easier to make a, a choice that suits you. If you come from a culture where you don't really have that choice, how it affects you is how it's going to affect many areas of your life, not only your sexuality. Because again, you are in service to, you are a, um, you are owned by, y your male makes those decisions for you. And that, of course, it's, you know, the narrative on that is that it will impact on all areas of your life from what you eat to what you dress to how you bring up your children to where you go to what you're comfortable with to who you converse with to what kind of job you can take what kind of education you can receive so that is very complicated and sexuality then is part of that obviously for you and I that is a very important part of it because we both see sexual health as an important part of feeling well in the world but it is only one aspect when a woman has a choice, so to speak, but it comes from a family who can't tolerate her level of comfort with herself or her partner can't or is very controlling, how does that affect a woman? Well, in my opinion, quite adversely, because you're not living authentically. You're not living your life. You are submissive to other people's wants, desires, um, etc. And that can adversely affect your ability to make choices around how you want to have sex, with whom you want to have sex, what kind of sexual practices you will enjoy, how you want to experiment. And so you have to shut down then in order to stay in a marriage or any relationship. And we both know that when you shut down one part of yourself, the rest follows because we don't really have that ability to shut down some feelings and not others, it kind of then becomes an inclusive uh, practice. And that once we have no voice, that is dangerous for men and for women. If you have no voice in your own life and you've had to shut down on your own experience and your own wishes and desires, in my opinion, it makes for very difficult living. 100%. So much there that you've given me of so much value. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about on the religious aspect, mm. and then we can maybe move away from that, is this idea that sex is taboo because there's such a connection between the act of sex right. being associated with the animalistic experience. Yeah. And that is not congruent with a, um, a spiritual act of, let's say, um, um, I've lost my word, um, procreation. Yeah. It's, so, it's not the spiritual union, so to speak, correct. that we are taught is the ultimate in our sexuality. Correct. Yeah. You you, some people cannot actually um, connect between, if this is a spiritual act, why does it feel so animalistic? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and again, complicated. I've certainly worked with women and men right across kind of cultures and perspectives. The thing that I, I, 
I want to make note of is that sometimes we have perceptions outside of a practice or a religion the way we make assumptions about that religion and it's not necessarily true because within a closed religion you're going to find people who practice it on the extreme where they put huge fences up in terms of practice and it can only be done in a certain way but if you actually go back to the original sources even within that religion what you discover in fact is that there's a lot more permission than you are aware of and people who learn that will tell you i've done you know i've trained clinicians marriage therapy with Ever their particular culture is, and I've learned over the year that the years that in fact there is a lot more permission in a lot more religions than you would actually know. Certainly, there are taboos around what is considered a little bit not modest, mm. but for the general rule, there are many religions that want married couples to have a good time intimately. Of that, it becomes a little bit iffy when there isn't that spiritual connected union. So to have a quickie or to just have sex because you're horny, you're tired, you're bored, you're hungry, you've had a hard day, you don't know what else to do, um, you're making up sex after fighting, which are all the aspects that we know how we use sex, that becomes a little bit more complicated in a spiritual union. Mm -hmm. And so do people even in much more flexible religions have permission to do that? I would say that there are people that certainly practice that but don't talk about it within their social circles, within their religion. Mm -hmm. But we're human, right? We are animals at some level. We do have sexual feelings. We do want a kind of a variety. Not We can't live on hamburgers and chips every day of the week. We need a little bit of chicken, a little bit of fish, and a little bit of vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the same menu that we prescribe for your sexuality. So if you come from an, uh, a space where only spiritual sex is acceptable, yeah, it's it's not ideal. It's not ideal. But it is a journey and it is a questioning and it is a reading and it's an opening up and it's a transparency and it's feeling safe with your partner to begin that process of looking at alternatives because I guess it depends how, you know, often spirituality and romantic sex get confused. But in my opinion, you can have a great spiritual connection that is also very animalistic and very sexual. You know, you can see it sexual. It's not just the harps playing, the candles burning, and, you know, the pretty uh, modest lingerie that we kind of associate with spirituality. We can reach great hearts and great spiritual connection through quite raw and rough sex. I agree with you. Yeah. And um, it reminds me as well about, um, you know, during the actual Connell, well, during, during pleasure, pleasurable sex how many times is god actually <laughs> the word god is being expressed in, in <laughs> orgasm <laughs> um and i know judy as well that um especially when i speak to gay men um yeah. they have a lot of guilt and shame more shame around the act of sex as being you know, the actual act itself brings about so much shame in uh, around being compared to animalistic yeah, of course. sex. So there's that issue that I've seen in my practice with gay men. And then the same applies to even men in heterosexual relationships. They also suffer from performance anxiety because of the grunting and the groaning that comes with an orgasm that they cannot reconcile the pleasure aspect. Right. Um, and then again, women as well, they, su they suppress the animalistic sounds as well that comes with 
pre-abandoned sexual pleasure. So I completely get that association with animals all in the wild and um, spirituality and that connection during um, intercourse. So that's a tough one where we have to normalize or we have to make a distinction between humans and animals yeah. and say, you know, say that God made us as pleasurable human beings on this earth and um, enabling us to have human experiences on this planet, which are different from animals. And also we must remember that um, animals copulate in times of, um, the word is on the tip of my tongue. Um, Stress. No, they copulate when, in times of um, fertility, when the woman is an egress. There we go. Right. When the female is an egress. And so it's not necessarily that a, ma that a male will just take a female when he's feeling horny. Yeah. It, it's completely biological, it's physiological in the animal kingdom. So, well, you know, that's not 100% accurate. I yeah. mean, in my, for my sins, I will read on animal sexuality because it just happens to be, this is an area that, you know, fascinates us. So I, I'm interested in how animals, you know, their experience as well. And, um, in fact, the book that I read most recently was a book called Bonk. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really just on animals bonking. Yeah. And, um, you know, <laughs> for my sins, I'm just like, <laughs> not something I like to admit at dinner parties. Uh, but um, you would. <laughs> of course, <laughs> conversation edge. But um, what she describes is, first of all, there are some primates that have sex because it feels good. Uh -huh. So there's the, I, I, no, I'm going to get this wrong, but the, I think it's the bonobo um, monkeys. They just have, all oh, they, uh -huh. they just bonk. <laughs> <laughs> they just enjoy, and there's no limit about who you can have sex with. Whether it's a child, an adult, a same gender, sex is the way to go in those particular animal groups. You know that, they find that pigs are orgasmic. So, even though they may only be having sex for procreation and because the female is now able to, to fall pregnant, they still enjoy the act. And that is more common than you would imagine. You know, the whole, all that stuff around oh, homosexuality is unnatural, you don't find it in the animal kingdom, plenty of homosexuality. Just because there is a way of connection, it is a shared experience. So it's not as rigid as we once thought that animals are animals and therefore only procreate mm. during sex. But it is it's almost starting to seem that there is a need mm. for closeness, for comfort, for physicality, for sex, and that many animals have an orgasm. And they look to repeat that process because it's an enjoyable process. So when we talk about animals now, it's not animals versus human. I guess there's lots of things that animals do that look human, mm. and there's a lot of things that humans do that can look animalistic. You know, you've got to be comfortable, animal life, you've got to be comfortable with your body, with your sexuality, mm -hmm. with experimentation, with being out there. Because, yes, of course, orgasm is not the most um, romantic space, neither for men nor for women. Mm -hmm. You have to really be comfortable with who you are and this experience that you have. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, there is an animal part. And I just say, well, so what? When you're very hungry, you you know, you stuff that burger down one time. You, there's lots of things that we could do that are not the most um, polite and not the most kind of good-looking things. And that comes down to a lot of our instincts and a lot of our basic needs. When we fight, mm. yeah, not such, not such a pretty space to be in. We can be very vicious, very brutal. Those claws come out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that information. So, so useful, so relevant. 
Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is the sex being completely taboo. Mm. Um, where do where else do we see that in terms of um, fetishism, kinks? Right. Tell me about that. Well, even if you're given permission to have sex because you're now married, you're in a right relationship, you know, you are uh, given permission to have sex with your partner, your husband, your wife, whatever it is, it's prescribed. So, you know, in Victorian England, the saying, close your eyes and think of England, was 100% an instruction given to wives before they were allowed to perform sexually. Now they'd married the man. And they were asked, you know, the, these young brides would say, how do I do this? What's going to happen? Half the time they weren't told. But what they were told was that they picked up their nighties, pulled it over their heads, and their husbands were allowed to penetrate them. What would you be doing at that time is you just say, I'm doing it for England. This is my patriotism. I'm going to close my eyes and just think of England. And that was just really about making sure that you're doing your duty. And those men, when they wanted to have a real sexual relationship, they were the ladies of the night. They would enjoy themselves in taverns and in pubs with prostitutes that enjoyed having sex, that were fun, that were bawdy, that were kind of out there to give themselves and the men a good time. So what happens is that that taboo state has kind of um, lent itself to the sexual practices that are comfortable. You can do missionary position, you know, maybe a couple of other positions that you can get away with the privacy of your room. Um, certain oral oral pleasuring has their still problems, anal pleasuring their still problems, and that's even within the safe space of your chosen partner. And then, of course, that leads on to your choices around um, using strangers, anonymity, BDSM, which is um, tying up and a little bit of slap and tickle, um, who you choose to have sex with, how many people you choose to have sex with. All that stuff is seen as taboo. And that's why. They are not in the mainstream. They're primarily found in clubs, in dungeons, um, in spaces that you need special permits to get access to because the, there is still a huge population that find that offensive. And it hasn't become as mainstream. It's spoken about mm. more. You can read about it more and you can certainly get lots of information, but the practice of it is still done privately, silently. It's not a thing you would talk about at a good dinner table. You know, well, at least we come to your table. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if we had the same table, oh, that God. is a dangerous situation. <laughs> Absolutely. So there is that whole taboo around sexual practice and who you're having sex with and how. Um, and almost. Um, Quite hard to make a choice about because in order to choose to do something out of mainstream, you really got to know somebody who knows somebody mm -hmm. to find, to have access to, to get introduced to, you know, to, you know, hold the secret of. Mm -hmm. So, um, still to be correct. I do find, however, so in my practice, I find that I'm still seeing the same taboos presented to me right but on the other hand around my peers friends colleagues definitely around colleagues it does seem to be more of this open conversation and a little bit more um liberty yeah um a different consciousness around certain taboos yes maybe because i'm doing a lot of webinars where so much more conversation about BDSM, about um, transgender, transsexual, binary relationships um, and the like that this seems to be more um, seems to be more acceptable conversation 
And that's why I'm not quite sure whether it's just because of the company that I'm keeping yeah. or what it is. But how do you think we do you a do you think that we are changing the scripts? Um, public opinion and so on. Do you see it in your practice? Do you see it in your daily life? And what do you think can be done to further change this narrative in our societies? Yeah, you know, what I find is that there may be a couple that are quite limited in their sexual repertoire, but they seem more easy to tolerate the discomfort of us talking about it in a session. 30 years ago, I, it was really hard to even get close to that discussion. Today, if I would ask a couple a question, do you use toys, for example? Um, if they don't, they are more tolerant of entertaining the idea. So they are curious, they're sexual curious, and they are if I say to them, well, here, here's one, go, go and use it, and please don't give it back, <laughs> um, they, they will do that. You know, they will kind of, once I've broached the subject and once I've explained how to use it, they seem more willing to experiment. That has changed. Because it's in a lot of media, you can get anything on the internet, and they're used to watching even non-hardcore porn are going to do certain things that would never have been done before. Listen, when I was a child, when I was a young adult, you couldn't see porn. You know, you had to really make an effort to get a porn magazine and a video and it was your prized possession. Today, it's, it's not like that. And whilst there's perhaps too much experience, because I believe that we become desensitized from too much exposure. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's also enough to learn. If you want to know how to orally pleasure your partner, mm -hmm. um, you gonna there is no reason not to know how to do that because you just have to click onto your internet on your phone, you know, where no one's watching, and there it is. There's one of 50 videos that are going to teach you. So, yeah, that's become more mainstream, and that is really an amazing, it's an amazing space to play in for us as therapists, because you, you're not spending so much time breaking down exposure. But I find I still give a lot of permission with a couple. It's you encouraging them, you're explaining. I did sex education for 20 years of my life in schools, in universities, and still people don't know how their bodies work, and still people don't know what happens during sex or how to have an orgasm. And so there's still that kind of, that wall up where even though the information is there, there is still a stigma or a taboo. And so I find that encouragement, that permission giving, that kind of normalizing of behavior is what I still do in the practice. So yeah, it's 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 there. And when we educate now, it's not so difficult to get information to educate. And it's not so difficult to do the education because people are more tuned in. But there's still a lot of that stuff where um, if you're not sexual in the world, you haven't really thought about the stuff. You kind of land up in a space. You're expected to know what to do, and you become completely intimidated because you don't know. And I find that working with a couple who were both um, virgins before they got married, yeah. it becomes such an endless cycle of shame that they um, experience throughout the the marriage until they come to see me, yes. that they actually never have the conversation about sex. Right. It's always awkward. Um, there's a lot of vaginismus in right. those circumstances. And vaginismus is the uh, a disorder that develops for the woman where penetration is very, very painful. Often they cannot actually consummate the yes. marriage for quite some time, um, I know of a couple actually for 
three years they haven't managed to consummate the marriage exactly. because it's so unbelievably painful. Um, and the conversation never actually happens because they're both so awkward about it. <laughs> and they don't have the words. They don't have the words. They don't have the vocabulary that secular couples have. And <coughs> I've never found it even a secular couples. Yes, absolutely, yep. without a doubt, that it is something that becomes so awkward mm -hmm. that in the beginning of those relationships, they like porn stars. There's no, there's no, ten, there's no end to what they expose themselves to, and then when they become serious in those relationships, the legs close, and there's no more sex. Right. Which is, my, uh, you know, I have another theory for that. But um, with these virgins, they really have no exposure to sex and the pleasurable right. aspects around it so we really diff we, what i enjoy about that is exposing them to the world right. of being in touch with their bodies and, and as you said giving them permission the other thing um, that i've experienced is that um and i've forgotten <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> um but maybe it'll come up just now you oh yes sex education yeah. Um, what surprises me, and because I do work with um, the ministry, Minister of Menstruation, Candice Chowa, we um, she's supporting a charity drive that I'm busy working on, which is called Free to Be Me. Right. We collect sanitary pads for an uh, impoverished community in Zimbabwe. So, by the way, um, if anybody wants to contribute to that sanitary drive campaign, you can reach us at Free to Be Me on or a link in my bio. Um, she works around menstruation and the taboo and shame that young girls still experience when they're menstruating, that they don't come to school, um, and because they have no access to sanitary. Can't, no, they yeah. don't have access. They might spoil their clothes. It's still the shame and the taboo, the discussion that does not happen yes. around menstruation exactly. is so sad that we are in 2021. Right. We're not living in the dark ages, and yet we are living in the dark. We're living in the dark exactly. ages. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so it's a problem because. Um, the education of mothers, it, you know, I've always said, I, I don't generally work with children in my practice. One of the major reasons why I don't is that it's, I find it really difficult. And one of the reasons I find it difficult is that the impact that you have is limited because you're sending back an adolescent into a home where there's been little change. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel about this level of sex education is that parents don't want to shift. They have a belief that if they destigmatize their daughters and their sons' sexuality, that they will then become promiscuous, that they will then hand it out to who is ever around. In fact, some of the research shows quite the opposite, that the more information you have, the more empowered you feel about your body, the more careful you are around taking care of that body. But I guess it's it feels for many parents like they're stepping into a dark hole. So most of the time they're not even educated around needing to educate. But even when you educate those parents, they can't seem to make the leap to change their behavior. So with menstruation, as you correctly point out, they wait for it to happen. The child doesn't know what is happening and they're frightened, and they don't know how to ask the mother. They don't know what to say uh, around the words that they use, the, pod, the body part that they have to kind of describe. So we're perpetuating that taboo and that stigma around our bodies, around what is a perfectly normal, healthy way of being in the world. And so, yeah, it's... It, it, it is still a problem. So if we take sex out of the picture, we just talk about body growth, body acceptance, um, eating, 
uh, what is okay in terms of how your body functions, menstruation, arousal, all that stuff which we refer to as sexuality, there's still a heavy taboo even around that stuff. Mm. And what your vagina means, what it should look like. The women that are so uncomfortable with their vaginas because they've never seen another vagina, their vagina's never been normalized. It's a dirty part of the body um, men still today young boys will tell you that the vagina is a smelly place it's kind of this repertoire that they develop and nobody stops it nobody talks about it their dads are not saying hey hang on a second don't stigmatize any part of the body yours or another person's so they come to the experiences with all that narrative in their head and then it's perpetuated in the couple or in the relationship and the disrespect for their own bodies and the disrespect for their partner's bodies. You know, men still today talk about our menstruation as, um, you know, how do you, how do you trust a woman who bleeds for six days but doesn't die? Like, <laughs> serious? Are we, are we yeah. still there? Like, yeah. what? The, you know, or she smells like fish mm. or all those taboo mm. things. And women don't know what to do with that you know because you don't you don't know you don't have the information you start to believe it you start to internalize it and reject it they hate their bodies absolutely you know? and of course men have the same self hate they watch mm. pornography and they can't talk about it because watching pornography is still taboo they see these men with these huge penises they look down by the way, when you look down, it always looks smaller than if you look in the mirror. So they look down, they see this average size penis, and they they believe they can't satisfy a woman. And they carry that decades and decades into their relationships. And it limits their growth and it limits the way they feel about their sexuality because they it's too taboo to say, I had this. I watched this pornography, you know, and I always used to say to, to the kids in my class, you know, the teenagers, those men are selected not because they're great at maths. <laughs> <laughs> These are not great communicators. They are selected by pulling down their pants and seeing the size of their penis. That constitutes, you know, I think it's 5% of the population in truth. Um, and all our schools are clamoring for that type of thing. Joke. Okay. <laughs> not joking. <laughs> Hashtag not joking. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when you speak to prostitutes, are they interesting to speak to? Oh, because, well, yes. Absolutely. Because you're saying to them, what do penises look like? Yes. Because they're seeing a lot of penises. Yes, yes. I mean, we need to go to the experts for that. And they say the following. They say 90% of men look the same. That when they get an erection, they're all kind of within a certain circumference and length. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are men even within that average that are a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. 5% are very big and 5% are very small. But for the main part, 90% of the penises they're dealing with, so to speak, are just kind of normal average. And the chances are really good, well, the chances are 90% good that you fall into that bracket. 100%. And what I always talk about uh, when I'm referring to porn is that it's an educational tool. We're yeah. talking about blowjobs um, and how to educate women on how to give a blowjob. I say when you're comfortable or whatever scenario, watch a, a, a porn show that's actually palatable for you and learn how to give a blowjob by watching porn exactly. and vice versa and vice versa. Yeah. exactly and um to remind people that this is a film set and these first it depends on which angle the camera is positioned at right. the fact that he's probably been given viagra to keep his heart on right and which makes him Go oh, oh, more and more and more and more, longer and longer and longer. Also, the camera is saying, "Cut, let's go again." Right. New position, different day, different day. It edited um, a whole different lot of scenarios. The woman has been sculptured and shaped and 
plucked, leached yeah. from head leached to toe. Yeah. And, um, you know, not all women look like that. And we have to also love our bodies and realize that we are normal right. and everybody looks everybody's body looks different yeah, exactly right. and be okay with that sure and educate our children that um, moms look like this really um, right. and they don't look like 16 year olds exactly yeah. and um yeah, just normalize the other thing that um comes to mind as you're speaking is that when we speak about sex as taboo is that um, we've got to remember that when we take away the taboo, when we normalize, we're giving permission to people to just be in their bodies. Yeah. And we have to encourage them to think out the box and to allow themselves a little taste. Yeah, to tolerate. To tolerate in bite sizes, yeah. a little bit at a time of what the uh, what they exactly what they can tolerate at a time, and 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 to tolerate the discomfort. Yes. So I suppose you bring up a great point because you're saying, okay, so if I'm listening to this program and I realise that I do see sexist taboo or I see certain practices or my internal landscape is quite uh, limited or prohibited around feeling comfortable with um, making love or um, you know experimenting with a partner then how do I change that to now this mm -hmm. is of course you know we're talking about um, a long time mm -hmm. it, it doesn't happen overnight it is a consistent practice at getting better of detabooing and destigmatizing the way we feel about our sexuality, our bodies, our partners' bodies and so on. But as you correctly mentioned, there's no easy way around this. this. There's no pull you can take for this. As with any other psychological shift, transformation or change, it's bite sizes, sometimes nibble sizes. It's sitting in the discomfort of not being in your comfortable space or place, but also creating safety around that. So it may be for you a conversation that you have with yourself. It may be a conversation you have with a partner. It may be about giving yourself permission, not even to self-pleasure, but to begin the process of touching a body, of examining your vagina, of seeing where, where everything fits in. It may just be picking up an article or a book or looking at the internet. It really is completely personal and subjective at what level you are and at what level you start the process of emerging into your own transformation and of empowering and the big word at the moment is of embodiment because that mind-body connection we see more and more is absolutely critical for an integrated life and an integrated experience. So it's not only tuning the mind whilst that is critical, it's also giving permission for the body to be involved in the process. So whether that's touching, looking, experimenting, giving permission, learning about practice, trying it a little bit, breathing through it, not liking it, trying it again. Because what you do, uh, lifting the taboo is an integrated process. You can't just say, okay, from Monday morning, 8 o'clock, I'm not going to feel stigmatized around my body, sex, or whatever it is. It's really an integrated process of bringing the body to play, the mind, oh, mind to play, consulting a professional, reading the right book, asking a friend, thinking about things. There is taboo that goes as far as saying, I can't even give myself permission to think about sex because it may be too confrontational for me. So maybe you're at that point where you give yourself permission to ask yourself the question, what do I think about sex? There are many people 
do not even ask themselves that question. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't asked yourself that question, you certainly can't educate yourself and you certainly can't educate your children because it's it's got to be, everything's got to be thought of in this world. That is our obligation, is to spend time thinking the issues through. And if we don't know what to think about, because we're so tabooed, to use it as a verb, um, then I have to find, I have to reach out to the resources. And luckily today, you can go onto the internet and you get a wealth of information. Even our bookshops are full of books that didn't exist 15 years ago, that are there now. There are chat groups, there's Instagram, there are amazing people on Instagram that spend huge amounts of their time looking to educate people, looking for you to connect with them, to understand their philosophies, to understand how they think about them. It's there at a click of a button. We've never lived in a time that we have had so much access to so much thought. Go on to Twitter. I mean, my God, there are amazing people on Twitter that all they do is think about sex and they share that with you. They're professors of sexuality and they've written books on sex and they will start your process of feeling comfortable in your own skin and removing the taboo and the stigma of whatever it is for whatever reason. And you can also do that in secret. You know, if you're not quite ready yet, you can educate yourself, you can expose yourself. And when you feel more ready and more knowledgeable, then to share that with a partner or to ask a parent a question or to discuss it with a friend. I love that. So, Judy, um, I just love talking to you and that's why I use you as a friend. <laughs> But um, really, I've always referred to you as a great source of information. Thank you. And your, your absolutely huge wealth of knowledge um, in so many aspects. So thank you so much for joining me on um, my show, my very first interview. Um, I also have to say that I'm just learning how the cameras work. Yeah. So forgive me if I have been a little bit um, temperamental with where I'm looking. No, that's okay. So it's like I'm looking at you, then I'm looking, looking at the camera. camera. No, but it's fine. So it's not disturbing because, you know, I could talk to a wall if I had to. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask you is how can people get hold of you? Do you have a website? Do you have an um, email address, an Instagram page? Uh, where, where can people get hold of you? That is an interesting question. I mm -hmm. do have a, a, a website. It's judyalter.com. Okay. And I don't have an Instagram, but certainly you can contact me directly on my cell phone. Okay. So I think that probably the best thing is that you they, they go through you. Okay. And if they need details about me, then they certainly can find out from you. It's probably a little bit sad for them just mm, going up. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, for all my listeners and viewers or the audience, please, if you would like to get hold of Judy Alter, please get hold of me and I will put you in touch with her. Thank you. So again, Judy, thank you so much for coming on my show. Thank you for having me. It's been and a treat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great stuff. And to our learner lovers, have a great week and please stay in touch with Totally Not Taboo for more very exciting interviews to come. I hope you've enjoyed our first one. Take care and um, why don't you try and tackle your personal taboos in whichever way is comfortable. <laughs>